afternoon, good late afternoon. Um, first, I just wanted to say thanks so much for inviting us to come speak. I'm gonna take us back to the global perspective um, and follow up on some of the great kind of teeing off that Dr. Israel Ballard did for us at Alive and Thrive. Um, we've done a few things together with PATH, and so I'm gonna um, expand on that a little bit today. Um, but I, just before that, I, like someone else said, I really like sharing personal stories. And um, I want to thank all the speakers who've, who've already talked today because I found myself just nodding aggressively with everything. Um, myself being a NICU mom, I, something that Dr. Rice said this morning really resonated with me, that um, you can have all of the knowledge about something in the world, but until you're actually experiencing it yourself, um, you realize that you absolutely know nothing. And um, there's so many challenges that come up from that. So. You know, when I was pregnant, I chose a baby-friendly hospital in the Washington, D.C. area. I work in breastfeeding promotion. I knew exactly what I had to do. I knew it was going to be so easy because I knew, you know, what, what it was to do. And then um, I had my baby nine weeks early, and everything changed, and there was no early initiation. There was no delayed cord clamping. There was no <laughs> breastfeeding until m weeks later. So um, there's always challenges that come up, and I think um, this is true for our work domestically, this is true for our work internationally as well. And so, so much of what um, you all have said today, I think is still still an issue, still a problem. I've experienced it myself, and um, the communities that we work with overseas also um, have some of the, the very same challenges. So I think we can learn a lot from each other in the international sphere and the domestic as well. Um, so, let me tell you just a bit about Alive and Thrive. Um, we are a Bill and Melinda Gates fun funded foundation, or we are funded by the Mil Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the governments of Ireland and Canada. Um, and we've been working since 2009 to improve the lives of women and children around the world. Um, this is primarily through nutrition, but also partnering with a lot of other sectors to do multi sectoral work. Um, we started in three countries back in 2009 in Ethiopia, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. And there, we really tried to do um, some pilot programs to show that you can actually make a huge impact in a relatively short amount of time to change nutrition behaviors at scale. And so um, we used three main pillars of our programming, which were um, interpersonal communication, counseling for infant and young child feeding, community mobilization, and also mass media as well. And then since 2009, we've expanded regionally to all of these um, areas that you see above on the map um, where we're currently working. So um, right now, I'm going to zero in a little bit on the Southeast Asia, which is the area in yellow here on the map, um, and tell you a bit about it, our experience there. So just to take a step back, um, in uh, Western Pacific region, which is part of Southeast Asia, or Southeast Asia is part of, um, every two minutes, one newborn dies. So infant mortality is a huge issue in this region. Um, when we look, when we drill down with that data, we see that in the first three days of life, we have huge amounts of infant mortality. It's, it's two out of three newborn deaths occur in the first three days of life. And then we drill down even further, and we can see that um, delaying the initiation of breastfeeding increases the risk of infection-related death. So if you're looking at hours after birth, um, just waiting for initiation for one day after birth can um, increase the relative risk of infection-related death threefold. So when we're looking at Southeast Asia, here's some data that breaks it apart by each country. Um, so you can see there's a lot of similarities across the countries, but some stark differences as well. Um, and it's a little confusing between the early initiation and the C-sections, but... Um, you can just differentiate that the early initiation is first. Um, you see really high rates of institutional births um, in most of the countries, except for notably in Laos and Myanmar. There's low rates of institutional births. We have growing rates of C-sections in many of these countries, which this map doesn't accurately depict, but you can see it's happening and it's growing. Um, and then we have really low rates across the board, almost, with early initiation of breastfeeding as well. So I want to tell you a bit of a story today about our work um, in Southeast Asia. So I first want to take you through some of what we've done in Vietnam um, and then talk about how um, we've taken those um, best practices, shall we say, and replicated them across the region, and we're working closely with all of our partners to do this. 
So Alive and Thrive's work in Vietnam first started in 2009, as I mentioned, or 2010. Um, and we were looking to um, see if we could make a huge impact primarily on breastfeeding rates. So what we did is we started uh, what we call a social franchise model, which were um, like little clinics where we did interpersonal communications. We did counseling for pregnant women and women with children under two on infant and young child feeding. So these were located all across the country. And in addition to the counseling centers, we also had mass media that was going all across the country as well about not feeding water, about exclusive breastfeeding, and about the importance of breast milk and other infant feeding practices. And so we saw after four years that um, you can see the I areas and NI areas. I is intensive, A and T intensive areas, which is where we had the counseling as well as the mass media and other community mobilization. And then the non-intensive areas, which is the dotted line, is where you just had the ongoing government work and um, the mass media as well. And so you can see we had a huge impact on exclusive breastfeeding rates. Um, there was, we had lower bottle feeding in the area where we were working. And then when we look at early initiation, it actually dropped. And so we can see that um, in non-intensive areas, it dropped even harder. So we had a bit, the program had a bit of a protective effect on that drop in early initiation rates, um, but it was still an issue. It was still a problem. Um, we realized that, you know, this, we weren't reaching with a high level of institutional births in Vietnam. We were missing something. There was a gap. We were programming to the community. We were programming to antenatal care visits and then counseling after the birth. But there was something happening around that birth um, where we weren't making any impact. And so um, only 26.5% of infants in 2014 began breastfeeding within one hour of birth. Um, so at the same time that this was kind of all happening and we were coming to this realization, um, WHO and UNICEF in the region um, had published the action plan for healthy newborn infants, newborn and infants in the Western Pacific region. And so this action plan presented um, a series of key interventions called early essential newborn care practices. And so they were key interventions delivered to the mother and child in the immediate postpartum period to try and prevent this, this, this huge issue of neonatal mortality. Um, so above is um, the early, early essential newborn care practices. And I want to call your attention to the kind of four in the middle here, which in um, Southeast Asia they call the first embrace. So these four practices I think have many different names depending on the communication campaign and the region of the world that you're talking about. Um, but this was what they called the first embrace, which was, um, I like how they say it, a prolonged cuddle time between the mother and baby immediately after birth before any routine separation or, um, or uh, cord clamping or suctioning or any of the other um, things that need to happen. And so this action plan was not only for normal births, but also for preterm, low birth weight infants, and sick newborns as well. Granted, the... Key interventions varied slightly country to country, um, but this was kind of the main overall um, key interventions which they put forth. So in addition to having these um, early essential newborn care key interventions, they also had to look at the demand side of things. Um, we knew we could change the guidelines and the protocols in the hospital setting, but that that might not make an impact if, if the communities and the mothers weren't asking for this um, and didn't know this was happening. And so they also, um, put together materials for a communication campaign to really increase the demand of families and caregivers to have this first embrace at birth. So what Alive and Thrive did in Vietnam was we worked uh, directly with the Ministry of Health and other partners as well to pilot these guidelines, the, the national guidelines in Vietnam, based on this action plan for early essential newborn care practices. So we piloted them in a couple of health facilities, and then once the guidelines were finalized, we helped do capacity building to roll them out in seven different, seven different provinces as well. And so um, these were first implemented for all vaginal deliveries in health centers in these seven provinces. And when we, when we talk about capacity building, here's a map to show the ones that Alive and Thrive supported, which if you don't know, Vietnam may mean nothing to you, so I'll skip it quickly. Um, but, but what we meant by capacity building was it wasn't just your typical training where 
doctors and nurses sit in a room very much like this. Somebody stands on a podium and lectures. It was really a coaching opportunity. It was one-on-one -on -one or small pairs or groups of people that were in the hospital, in the delivery room, in the, um, in the ANC visits. And they were really working directly with the doctors, um, not just in OBGYN doctors, but all across the board. They had infectious disease doctors. They had neonatologists. They had all of the different classifications. I'm not a doctor, so I don't know all these things. But anyone who's involved in birth um, and any birth complications throughout the entire um, life cycle for the mom. So it was that along with supportive supervision in order to make sure that they were constantly watching what was happening, um, not constantly, periodically watching what was happening and to self-correct at that exact moment rather than having to go back and then just tell someone what they did right or wrong later. Um, and then we had the monitoring, which was really important for us. Um, we worked within the hospital and the uh, ministry monitoring um, systems already in place, the HMIS systems. Um, but we also added our own indicators. And then what we did was we made sure that we were analyzing those reports and to be able to feed information back um, to say, this isn't working. Things aren't changing in this hospital. We need to do more supportive supervision and the like. Um, and so our initial results were great across all the provinces in which we worked. We had um, rising early initiation rates. You can see the graph starts right before the training, and so it immediately jumps up um, across all of the provinces and it stays relatively high. But we can see that we still have an issue with cesarean deliveries. Um, it did increase, even though the guidelines didn't specifically say they were for cesarean, but it, it didn't increase very much, and we still had a huge gap between vaginal and cesarean. Um, and we also knew within the context of Vietnam that we had increasing rates of cesarean sections. Um, it increased from 20 to 28 percent in just that three-year period. Um, and part of the reason was because in Vietnam, families believe that there are certain days that are more auspicious than others. So um, families wanted to, or mothers wanted to deliver on a certain day rather than another day. Um, your child could be angrier if they delivered on a Friday versus a Sunday. So there's lots of those types of things in the culture. Uh, we also had... Um, the doctors preferred C-sections. It was easier to schedule. And they also got higher health care reimbursements from um, C-sections as well. Um, so we had this gap that we identified. And so what we did was, um, and this monitoring data helped us identify this gap, essentially. Some of the challenges are listed here, um, why there was such a gap additional to what I just said, but that providers had limited skills. They didn't feel like they had time to perform this when there was a C-section involved because there were so many other pressing needs and things that needed to happen. So what we did is we, again, piloted the same guidelines with um, modifications for cesarean deliveries um, with the Ministry of Health and partners again. And we piloted them in different um, hospitals, and then we finalized them and rolled them out in all of the provinces where we were working. So we did the same aspect of capacity building, this coaching, supportive supervision, the exact same thing, but for C-section specifically in addition to the regular normal deliveries as well. And so here were the results um, starting from the very beginning all the way through to the end of this work um, in Vietnam. So this was Da Nang Hospital for Women, which um, was already the best performer. This is kind of the best case scenario in Vietnam. They were one of the champions of this work from the beginning. You can see that their rates of early initiation were already very high to start with. Um, but we still had improvements, and especially when you look at the cesarean gap, we had vast improvements in Da Nang, and we really closed that gap um, almost immediately as soon as the guidelines were released. Um, here's another one, just a, a little bit of a different scenario in Quang Nam. They started off relatively high for vaginal deliveries, much lower for cesarean jumped around a bit. You could see when the training um, happened, a lot of people applied it to cesareans anyway. Um, and then it leveled off and it didn't really increase until we rolled out the guidelines and the trainings around the 1609 or 1611 mark, which is um, year first and then month, in case you're curious. Um, and then it improved, but we still have a gap. So we can see there's still work to do. And then in Huey, um, very low rates of early initiation for cesareans in this um, facility. It jumped around, it stayed very low, and so in this case we could see, you know, we really needed to do something here. They really needed to um, do more training, do more supportive supervision, and where I circled here is right when the guidelines were officially released and they finally um, got the training for the cesareans, you could see that they had huge improvements that almost met exactly the rates for uh, vaginal deliveries. 
does drop off a little bit at the end, which is disconcerting. So we're, there's still work to do. <laughs> Um, and this is just an aggregate of all the results across all the seven provinces. So you can see um, uniformly across all, there's lots of regional disparities as I just presented, but um, we can see the huge difference between cesarean and vaginal here, and then how it did start to really um, close that gap after the cesarean guidelines were also released. So there's a few factors that enabled success. Um, these were national early and essential newborn care guidelines that were rolled out. It wasn't something that a program was coming in to do or a few hospitals wanted to do. It was something that was really mandated by the government. Um, we had active leadership in all of the facilities that really held practitioners account accountable. It wasn't just a matter of, you know, how do we change a provider behavior? It was, it was really coming from the top down. And especially in a culture like Vietnam, that means a lot. Um, you have to consider whether that's as important in other places that you're working. Um, but in Vietnam, that was really important. And then also just this on-site coaching. Um, it wasn't just a training or a one-off training. It was really a continued immersive experience in the hospitals to make sure that they were rolling, out, rolling this out and rolling it out correctly. Um, and so what does that mean now for the region? So this, as I said, started in Vietnam. And um, actually, I do want to mention, too, as um, Kirsten had said, this is happening in the context of also them developing the first human milk bank in Vietnam, which is a key piece of any early essential newborn care uh, protocol in place. And so um, I actually had the pleasure of going to Vietnam just two months ago to see the human milk bank in action and to see um, all these guidelines actually happening, and it was a really exciting um, thing to watch. And so um, that's also a key piece to the success of the story, is having that donor milk in place for the sick and, new, and, um, and premature babies and low birth weight babies as well, to be able to provide the human milk for them also. So what are we doing in the region? Um, we are working with governments in a number of these countries to also roll out similar guidelines. Um, and we're also working to ensure maternity entitlement protections, um, to look at baby-friendly hospital initiative as well, and other kind of policy type level um, changes. In Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar specifically, we are looking at strengthening the health systems overall to be more breastfeeding friendly. Um, and in that, they're, they're looking to establish what they're calling centers of excellence for breastfeeding. And so these are essentially centers that they can point to and, and do cross-cultural exchanges and international exchanges across the region um, that deliver high-quality breastfeeding services um, and also leverage these platforms like early essential newborn care, BFHI, like we talked about earlier, other quality improvement measures as well. Um, and so we're providing assistance to the governments to establish and sustain these. Um, and some of the ways in which we've done this is we recently hosted um, a regional advocacy workshop in Da Nang with, a, again, a bunch of partners and other um, governments in the region to share experiences, learn from each other. Um, I think that the picture that you presented was from that. Did you go? Oh, that's fantastic. So you can probably talk about this more than I can. But um, different uh, workshops like that have been hosted uh, over the last few years. Um, and they're also building on this momentum in the region to really share and learn from each other. And Alive and Thrive and other partners have been there to help coordinate that um, learning and sharing. Um, and then in that workshop and in other forums, country teams have developed roadmaps and strategies for breastfeeding friendly health systems. Um, so this is not just looking at at delivery, like I was explaining with the early essential newborn care, but it's looking at the entire health system. Antenatal care is one of the huge aspects that um, is a focus of this as well. And so what does this mean? Um, this is just some examples. Um, there's a lot more that I could go into in this slide, but I'm gonna keep it very brief. Um, but you can see that um, according to the UNICEF building blocks of a, of a healthy um, health systems, there's leadership, financing, workforce, service delivery, supplies, technology, information, and resources. And so among that, we have to look at each level of those building blocks where we can ensure that we are a bre breastfeeding friendly health system. So in Vietnam, we have the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding. We have BFHI that is being taken over by the government to um, help them have, have them help certify the health facilities, like Ruth was saying before that California does. Um, in Laos, we have 
counseling as an essential component of ANC and PNC guidelines. And so there's different things that countries have done. And the beauty of this cross-learning is to be able to share these successes and resources and everything with each other to ensure that, you know, as one country in the region is, is gaining momentum and increasing and improving, the other countries can do the same as well and learn from each other. So here are just some of the key partners that we are working with in Southeast Asia. Specifically, um, this is not something that Alive and Thrive has done on our own by any stretch of the imagination. And some acknowledgments um, for, for those that have helped pull this presentation together and, and this work as well. Um, and again, special thanks to Giacomo Perosi, who took many of the beautiful photos on the trip that I went with him to Myanmar and Vietnam. So um, it was wonderful to meet so many of these families and see firsthand the work of early essential newborn care. So thank you so much. I guess I can take questions. Is there any questions? Hi, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, it's so interesting to think about um, the global work and how it can apply here in the United States. I'm the phys My name is Lori Winter. I'm the physician lead on the Kellogg-funded CHAMPS project. We're working in Southeast United States doing a very similar project where we have community activation and we have all this interpersonal communication. We lack the mass media piece, but I'm really curious about the details in which you explain the importance of leadership when it came to the physician change or healthcare provider change in the growing number of institutionalized deliveries mm -hmm. that are occurring. And is part of that leadership the institutional leadership or is it really external coming from governmental input and, and is part of our challenge maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Here in the United States, the fact that we can even have institutional leadership and yet without sort of that governmental leadership, it may fall on deaf ears when it yeah. comes to physician engagement and physician change. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, putting my social and behavior change hat on, <laughs> um, I think context really matters here. and. Um, Presenting what I did for Vietnam and, and talking about how we're taking it to other countries in the region, we're, I mean, we knew this going in, but we're realizing even more that it's very different. Vietnam is a very different context than a lot of these other countries. And so just culturally in Vietnam, it's, um, there's a lot of respect for elders and for institutions and for protocols. And so we found that working with the ministry and working with the health facility leadership and having it be a really top-down thing worked um, very well for us. We were lucky that we had a very um, a government that was very attuned to what we were trying to do and very supportive. And so um, it, um, there were struggles, I'm sure, in certain facilities, which you can see some of the rates, you know, it, it, especially for cesareans. There was a lot of pushback for cesareans. Um, but once things really started getting going, um, you had these champions. Like I said, you had the Da Nang Hospital, the, really the high performer. And they were kind of really being elevated in the country as this, this champion, this, you know, this great hospital that everyone should aspire to be. And so that really worked um, in Vietnam. However, if we look at another country, um, it's probably not going to work as well. And so you have to kind of utilize other factors to really motivate the providers or motivate the facility leadership itself, itself to institutionalize these protocols and these guidelines. Um, so I don't, not knowing the U.S. context as much, I can't really, you know, I've learned so much today about Medicare and <laughs> ACA and all these things because I really don't work much in the U.S. But, um, but yeah, I think just doing enough formative research to figure out really what motivates the providers and what motivates the hospital to institute one guideline versus another could actually help you figure out how you can actually make a change because I think it is really different. Sorry, that's kind of a non-answer. Thank, you. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. I'm just curious who's providing the training and who and who's ending up. How are you preventing from being humanitarian colonialists? Like, how are you making sure that this is empowering the community that, and that 
if your organization ceases to exist, if the leadership exists within the local community? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we have a, a big office. At least during this time, we had a large office in Vietnam uh -huh. that was almost entirely staffed by Vietnamese nationals. Okay. Um, there's a lot of capacity in Vietnam as well. And so we worked with national trainers and okay. trainers from our own organization. Um, and some of these champions, like I said, like some of the people, the the people high up in Da Nang Hospital for Women served as champions and champion okay. trainers. And so um, we kind of don't really even use the word training because it really was so much more than that. Great. And so it wasn't somebody like me going over there okay. and talking to a room full of people and telling them what to do. It was really um, people from Vietnam who were working within their own country to elevate the, the practices there. Because I, I totally identify with what you're saying and I think it's very important. Thank you so much.